to your level. Tenaku, Mr. Speaker, kia ora tātou katoa i tēnei pō. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in doing some research about this particular bill today, I came across some information that set me back a little bit. The 2006-2007 uh, gaming and betting survey revealed that 86% of Māori had participated in gaming over the last 12 months. 86%. That Māori spent more on average than any other demographic group uh, with an annual spend of approximately $644. And the third figure, three quarters of Māori who participate in such activities believe that they have broken even when playing the pokies. Mr Speaker, I think that the last statistic is probably the saddest one. Breaking even simply doesn't add up when one looks at the long list of criminal activities associated with, ga with gambling. Perhaps the more correct term might be breaking and entering, or theft, forgery, embezzlement, fraud, credit, credit card scams. Uh, counterfeiting, assault, child neglect, prostitution, vandalism, loan sharking, money laundering and home invasion. We could describe all of these as the collateral damage associated with or caused by uh, gambling. Mr Speaker, perhaps the most tragic outcome of all is the crime against families that occurs when those who are drawn to the casinos and pokey machines gamble away, gamble away relationships by breaching the trust of family members, and I've seen that myself first hand. Mr Speaker, this bill today does not reduce the activity of gambling. It does little to address the, the path of pathological gambling or to develop strategies which address the, the harmful effects on our communities, the wider social, economic and health costs. Uh, but there, there are some uh, increased provisions within the bill which will identify and assist problem, problem gamblers, and, and this is a game. Uh, Mr Speaker, I want to outline the Māori Party position right from the outset. Uh, our commitment to this issue is such that my colleague Hone Harawira uh, sat on the committee of, uh, for this bill as a non-voting member. Uh, I'm told that there were 168 submissions. We wanted to respond to all of those. We were also involved uh, and, and influenced by the community hui, the national conferences, the advice of key org organisations along, uh, along with the Problem Gambling Network and the excellent advice from the expert uh, specialists such as Dr Lorna Dahl uh, from Heringa Waka o Te Ora. Uh, Farno and John uh, Stansfield of the Problem Gambling Foundation. The expert analysis of all of these individuals and organisations is invaluable in us uh, in advising us of the significant and harmful effects caused by uh, gambling. Mr Speaker, I want to remind the House that Māori and Pacifica peoples are more likely than other groups to suffer gang gambling related harm and that there is a ripple effect that goes all the way through whānau through families, hapū and iwi from gambling. The best estimates <coughs> from Dr Dahl predict that up to 239,000 239, people could be potentially adversely affected by Māori problem gambling when we take into account the impact on whānau and others. 239,000. To me, Mr Speaker, this is one of the great concerns that I see around the expansion of gambling in our modern lives. Now, personally, I'm opposed to the practice of gambling as an unwise, potentially addictive habit. The decision to indulge in unwise investments has, I believe, a destructive and damaging influence on families, on whānau. In essence, those with money to burn on gambling should remember their responsibilities to care for their whānau. Mr Speaker, Catherine Poe, a councillor from the Problem Gambling Foundation in Christchurch, I'm told demonstrated a factual, a factual nature of this point of view. She gave evidence about relationship uh, problems, financial stresses, personal stresses, loss of employment, crimes and suicide, all examples of the devastation incurred by families and communities. From that same city, the 198 Youth Health Centre was concerned that gambling is still in oversupply and spoke of the need or spoke to the need to address the significant and ongoing negative social, health and economic costs on families and communities. Mr Speaker, the bill has responded to these concerns with a very specific provision around problem gambling. The Select Committee has recommended that a, a venue uh, manager should be liable for any failure to display a notice in the gambling area advising customers that the venue has a policy for identifying problem gamblers. And so we support uh, that a, we, we do support the note that a, a clear and absolute statement of responsibility as outlined in the report 
uh, from the Government Administration Select Committee. But there are many, many other issues that need to be addressed to reduce the harm uh, being done by pokies, particularly to Māori, Pacific Island peoples, Asian, uh, low-income workers, beneficiaries and, and, of course, their communities. As a consequence of our concerns, we included a minority report in the Bill recommending that Government should act with urgency to uh, firstly devolve greater power to local authorities to reduce venue numbers, uh, secondly to investigate new technologies such as player uh, tracking and pre uh, pre-commit um, cards. Uh, thirdly, restrict how pokey funds committed to racing are applied, and others have spoken about that. And fourthly, require the Department of Internal Affairs to publish clear reports about where funds come from as well as where they go. We carried on to ask that there's a need to address serious issues around the role of trusts in the distribution of pokey funds, and finally, to reform and improve the way in which the, the problem gambling levy is administered. Mr Speaker, I did want to point out the real on, irony within the industry. As I understand it, more than $58 million per year is being siphoned out of the charitable gaming sector into the racing industry. Now, others sort of touched on this matter, uh, but I think it does uh, worthy a mention as we discuss this particular event, uh, this bill tonight. The recent controversy that erupted over the Christchurch-based Eureka Trust giving over 75000 to the Oamaru Harness Racing Club has drawn criticism from some quarters. Morally, one would expect that gambling profits accrued within Canterbury should stay within Canterbury, not diverted south. But even more important is the simple pr principle that money which is taken from the activity of gambling should not be, re -redire should not be redirected to another form of gambling. Mr Speaker, in speaking to the submissions, again, the Porirua Problem Gambling Network urged the Select Committee to ensure that any new devices and machines should at least be less harmful than existing machines. The Waitakere Association for Gambling Action highlighted the oversupply of gambling opportunities with more than 300 pokey machines available within a short distance of the Auckland Casino. Terry Huriwai, Project Manager for, Raki, uh, for Matua Raki, the National uh, addiction treatment workforce development program advocated a need to strengthen consumer protection measures and other strategies to minimise harm. The Wellington People's Centre spef uh, specified far more meaningful avenues for profits generated from gambling to be distributed. It was their position that the amounts given in grants should be increased given the cost of gambling to the community. This at least was a move towards the recognition of the impact of poverty family breakdown, suicide, uh, bankruptcy, and so on. Mr Speaker, these are just a few of the strong and consistent views that um, advocated for further consideration of issues around the problem gambling. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's my understanding that in all, some 108 submissions held the view that more comprehensive amendments are needed over and above the changes proposed in this bill. And I'd have to say that I have some empathy to the position that um, substantial reform is needed to achieve the original intent of the Gambling Act. I'd remind us all that the purpose of the Gambling Act is extremely significant. There is a commitment to control the growth of gambling, the aspiration to prevent and minimise the harm caused by gambling, including problem gambling. Uh, there's a call to ensure the integrity and fairness of games while at the same time to facilitate responsible gambling. And importantly, the Act makes a commitment to ensure that not only will the profits of gambling benefit the community, but also to facilitate community involvement in decisions about the provision of gambling. Now, these are important principles that we must reconsider and revitalise in the work ahead. Mr Speaker, my own kinsman, Ananu Budwa, who is heavily involved in supporting those uh, with gambling issues in Rotorua, is one who will acknowledge that this bill does not go far enough, uh, but it does go in the right direction. Yep. It's a first step, and the Māori Party will support this bill as one way of supporting the change that we want to see. I call Dr Jackie Blue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm pleased to speak to the second reading of the Gambling Amendment Bill No. 2. Mr Speaker, gambling is a growth industry in New Zealand. It is an industry which can cause great harm and devastation to individuals and families. New Zealanders have a reputation as some of the world's heaviest gamblers. Gambling, the tradition in New Zealand, has gained strength over the last 10 years through the rapid growth and expansion of the gambling industry. 
For many people, gambling is an enjoyable recreational activity. For some, it may be once a year on the Melbourne Cup, but for many, it is a normal part of their week's activity. Those who have serious interests in gambling usually devote a great deal of money and time to it. Mr Speaker, unfortunately, problem gambling can result in relationship problems, separation and divorce, job problems, absenteeism and loss of employment, financial stress such as bankruptcy, legal problems such as stealing and committing other illegal acts to finance gambling, family problems including domestic violence and neglect of family life. Mr Speaker, I want to talk for a short time on problem gambling and domestic violence. There is a link. There is evidence that domestic violence is more prevalent amongst problem gamblers in the general population. There have been a number of studies that support this. A few years ago, a survey of 144 spouses of compulsive gamblers indicated that half of them were physically and verbally abused by their spouses and 12 per cent had attempted suicide. A 1993 study found that 23% of pathologic gamblers admitted to hitting or throwing things more than once at their spouse or partner. Mr Speaker, 1 in 10 gamblers in counselling reported domestic or other violent incidents related to their gambling. There's no doubt gambling affects family members. A 1999 survey of 215 spouses of pathological gamblers indicated that they suffer from symptoms such as headaches, stomach problems, dizziness and breathing difficulties, in addition to emotional problems of anger, depression and isolation. These were usually due to psychological abuse. Children, Mr Speaker, of problem gamblers were reported to be two to three times more likely to be abused by the gambler and his or her spouse than their peers. This is a tragedy, Mr Speaker. Gambling affects families, rips them apart. Mr Speaker, this bill goes some way to addressing these serious issues of gambling. The proposed amendments of this Act will tighten the regulations around monitoring gaming. Importantly, Mr Speaker, with the proposed amendments, organisations or people who receive grants from gambling societies need to be accountable for how they spend that money. Gambling is a money-making business, there's no doubt about it. As a result of increases in expenditure on non-casino gaming machines, racing and sports betting and lotteries commission products, gambling expenditure in 2006 and 2007 increased for the first time in three years to just over $2 billion, which matched the 2003 four-figure. As a result of electronic monitoring to which all non-casino gaming machines have now been connected since March 2007, we have accurate up-to-date figures for that part of the sector. Expenditure on these machines was almost $1 billion to the end of June 2007. In the 2006-07 year, turnover exceeded $14 billion, expenditure was just over $2 billion, Gambling provided $400 million to community purposes, almost $90 million to racing clubs, and over $285 million in sector-specific taxation. In the calendar year 2007, problem gambling intervention services funded by the Ministry of Health assisted over 5,500 first-time clients with gambling problems. Gambling is epidemic, Mr Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to update the Gambling Act 2003, which took effect 1 July 2004. The Gambling Act 2003 brought major reforms and in particular a change in focus towards the minimisation of harm associated with gambling. However, since it came into effect, a number of issues have emerged which have been addressed by this bill. The Gambling Amendment Bill No. 2 was introduced in August 2007 and reported back by the Government Administration Committee in May 2008. This, the Government has elected to progress this bill with a number of minor policy and technical amendments. The amendments to the Act will tighten the regulations around monitoring game, gaming. Mr Speaker, organisations or people who receive grants from gambling societies need to be accountable for how that money is spent. This bill addresses it. There have been concerns that there have been instances where gaming profits have been used to ease cash flow and then been unable to be accounted for. That is not satisfactory. 
There is therefore an amendment and requirement that gaming machine profits will need to be banked directly into the Gaming Machine Society's bank account. There is also a requirement that community grant recipients use grants only for that specific authorised purpose for which the grant was made. Importantly, the justification for requesting the grant cannot be changed, and I'm sure members will not have any issues with that particular amendment. Specifically, there is an amendment that sets out the circumstances in which a game machine society may use proceeds for its own authorised purpose rather than distributing grants to the wider community. There will be an absolute duty for gambling venues to assist suspected problem gamblers. They cannot turn their backs on these people. It will not be sufficient for gambling organisations to approach a person on one occasion, provide information and then do nothing further if the person's gambling behaviour continues to be of concern. Gambling organisations will have to be accountable. There are regulation-making powers that will enhance harm prevention and minimisation measures. For example, mo mobile FPOS devices will, will be prevented from being taken close to gaming machines and players. This means that a player would have to walk away from a gaming machine to obtain additional cash from an FPOS device. Currently, the Secretary of Internal Affairs can currently collect information from people involved in the conduct of gambling to facilitate the objectives of the Act. The new clause 99A enables the Secretary to specify what information should be collected, how often and the manner and the form in which the information should be provided. This information may include details about how gambling profits are distributed or granted. The amendment further requires the Secretary to publish any resulting statistical information on the Department of Internal Affairs website or in another publicly accessible electronic form. There is the power to conduct gambling equipment research in gambling venues. Currently the Secretary for Internal Affairs is not authorised to test gambling equipment in a real-life gambling environment, making it difficult to assess the likely impact of equipment. There are a number of technical amendments that have been included in the Bill. There is a clearer definition of the words gaming machine to ensure that equipment associated with gambling is not captured. For instance, there are equipment such as electronic card shufflers that do not need the same level of regulation. The insertion of clause 81AA provides that a venue manager rather than the holder of the venue licence is liable for failure to display a notice in the gambling area advising customers that the venue has a policy for identifying problem gamblers. Mr Bill, this bill does address some serious issues regarding problem gambling. Under this bill, a licence holder or casino operator is required to keep a record of every person excluded from their venue and provide this information to the Secretary of Internal Affairs on request. In summary, Mr Speaker, Gambling damages homes and communities. This amendment, the amendments to this Act will tighten the regulations around monitoring gaming. Licensed venues and people who work in them will be responsible for monitoring people who come to gamble. The people who work in gaming venues and casinos will now be vetted more strictly. The Bill allows for regulation on the collection of important information around the gaming industry, the people, the money and the organisations involved. The amendments are consistent with the intent of this Act to minimise harm. Mr Speaker, I commend this, this Bill to the House. I call Grant Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And it, it's a pleasure to join in this debate. It's, it's been a very interesting debate in, in one sense because of the quite clear view across the House, I think, that, that there are, is significant further work to do in terms of our gambling laws. And the, the Gambling Act 2003 was, was an excellent piece of legislation, but it, it was dealing with what we all know to be a very complex and um, troubling area. It's an area that's full of, of moral hazards, but it is, of course, the source of funding um, for many of our sporting and cultural organisations. And the balance that was attempted to be struck in the Gambling Act 2003, I think, I think produced some many good outcomes. And we've certainly heard of those already tonight. My colleague, uh, Darian Fenton, has mentioned uh, the, the uh, moratorium on casinos. We've seen a drop-off in the number of um, Class 4 or pokey machines as Class 4 gaming machines. 
pokey machines as they're more commonly known. So we have seen some good consequences uh, from that legislation. Uh, the Gambling Act itself um, in 2003 was also bluntly the result of a need for the then Labor minority government to put together a majority uh, to pass the legislation. And as a result, it had a number of negotiations, which I, um, in a previous life, participated in. And it was difficult to bring the, the law together, and it, of course, had some imperfections um, once it was finally passed. And this bill does indeed deal with some of those uh, imperfections. But it is largely uh, a technical bill, and as other speakers have noted, uh, when the Select Committee heard submissions, uh, many of those submissions sought uh, uh, a mandate to go much further than what the bill actually does. And as I've said, uh, it's, it's pleasing to hear members across the House um, addressing some of those issues, and, and I hope that this Parliament will indeed be able to take up a number of those issues in one form or another. But it is important to note that this bill is not going to address those deep issues of concern, but that doesn't delegitimise them. And a number of other speakers have mentioned uh, the impact on gam of gambling on New Zealand society, and I think it is worth just setting that context out, Mr Speaker, so that people can be aware of the importance of having regulation around an issue such as gambling. Uh, we do know that every day in New Zealand, $2.77 million is lost on pokey machines. That's not the amount of money that's actually bet in pokey machines, that's the amount of money that is in fact lost every day, over $2 million. And we know that disproportionately that money has been lost in, in low socioeconomic areas. Um, if we use the, the decile categories, in decile 9 there is one pokey machine for every 75 people. In decile 1 there is one pokey machine for every 465 people. So problem gambling and the problems associated with poking machines are far more evident in our low socio-economic areas. Uh, we also know that 3% of the adult population are problem gamblers, but they actually account for 24% of the expenditure on gambling. Obviously that's the very point. They are problem gamblers because they are um, betting in far in excess of others in society and often far in excess of the resources that they bring to, to the gaming machines. So the, the, the problem of gambling in New Zealand is, what is, is deep, it's widespread, and the original Gambling Act did make an attempt to, uh, to deal with that. And I also want to particularly refer to uh, Richard Wirth's speech uh, um, at the beginning of this uh, first reading debate. Well, um, he, he did avoid talking about some of the conflict of interest categories that are in here, but uh, I actually want to, want, to praise, I want to praise the Minister who's been under a little bit of pressure lately because he did make very clear that his commitment to working on a number of issues related to gambling, in particular on wanting to work to ensure that a greater percentage of money that is involved in the gambling sector actually gets to support community groups. And I think all of us in the House, having acknowledged that, that gambling is part of our society, would want to see proceeds being returned uh, to, to the community. Because what we know at the moment is that money from, from um, class four machines, from pokey machines, effectively 20% of it um, goes in duty, 37.5% of the losses should go out in grants to the community, but this doesn't necessarily benefit the community where the money was actually bet. We also know that venues and pubs can claim a maximum of 16% of losses um, for administration costs. So that's leaving around 40% of money that could in fact be paid out. So I think I join with the Minister in, in, the, in his crusade to try and um, ensure that more money does go to the community. And I do hope that we can work on an issue like that uh, across the House. Uh, what this bill actually does, though, is it seeks to um, enhance the purpose of the original Gambling Act. And I think it is important to set that context. So the purpose of the 2003 Act is to control the growth of gambling. It's a harm minimisation approach. And that is the approach that we were able to gain a consensus for in 2002-2003. There were some in Parliament at that time who wanted to go further, but that seemed, seemed to be the consensus that we could get. So the bill also was able to uh, facilitate responsible gambling and ensure the fairness of games and try and limit opportunities for crime or dishonesty associated with gambling. And then, as I say, as I mentioned earlier, ensure that money from gambling actually benefits the community. So what this bill does is try and deal with some of the, the imperfections. And one that I particularly want to talk about is the suitability of a person who holds a Class 4 licence. A Class 4 licence is obviously the licence that governs uh, uh, most of the pokey machines that we're talking about. And while in the original Gambling Act there were a number of good measures put in place to try and determine the suitability of, of people to hold licences, this bill does widen that. 
And one thing in particular it does is it can take into account matters that have, um, a person has been involved in in the previous seven years rather than the ten years that's currently in the bill. That's an improvement, Mr Speaker, and I think it will allow um, significantly more uh, investigation and significantly more factors to be taken into account uh, when someone is deciding whether they should be um, able to hold a Class 4 licence. Um, the powers have also been extended so that a director of a company that has been placed into receivership um, or put into liquidation or has been involved in events leading up to, to that happening um, will not be able to get, uh, or that factor will have to be taken into account if, if they are going to get a Class 4 licence. Anyone who has been prohibited or disqualified from acting as a director um, in a company is also um, put out of action in terms of um, holding a licence. And, and other, other clauses have been inserted to ensure that uh, anyone who has had any uh, impropriety in terms of their role as a company director is also not able to, to hold a Class 4 licence. So I think that is a positive step forward because we are all aware of the stories uh, that are uh, in our community about uh, the rorts that, that um, uh, perhaps apocryphally have taken place in a number of parts of the country where, where pubs or, or clubs have forced sporting or community organisations to come into a pub and drink there in order to be able to receive the benefits of, of money that's um, come from pokey machines. And, and, and we've had earlier speakers in the debate mention specific examples of that across the community. I think we all recognise that that's not a satisfactory uh, situation. There has been an improvement in that, and the Gambling Commission has had a role in, in, in monitoring that. But I also think that that is one area that we could continue to look more into, is the question of the distribution of grants both being in the territorial authority area from which, in which the gambling takes place, but also um, to ensure that those who um, run pubs and clubs where, where, where there are gaming machines are not acting in a way that uh, community organisations and sporting organisations feel they have to follow. I just want to echo one other comment that uh, my uh, colleague Darian Fenton raised earlier, and that's the question of the placing of gaming machines in outdoor areas. And uh, this is a, a concern that I know the Labor members of the Select Committee raised when the bill was in front of the Select Committee. And, and we would hope um, later on in the committee stages to be able to come back to this question because uh, it, it is, of course, um, not going to help with a harm minimisation approach if we have people who are able to gamble outdoors, which means that they can continue to smoke continue to, to, to drink their drinks in that outdoor area and, and part of this, the original Gambling Act's intention was to try and provide a situation in which there were opportunities to break in to a pattern of gambling and we already know that in the Gambling Act and we're just in the, in the process now of seeing this implemented, the pop-up um, messages that are to appear on gaming machines to indicate to somebody how long they've been there, how much money that they've actually spent. So those kinds of harm minimisation uh, messages are important and uh, they are also enhanced by this bill. So Mr Speaker, there are uh, uh, several other elements that I think uh, are useful changes and useful uh, improvements that the amendment bill brings in. One of them is to uh, widen the numbers of people who are required to, uh, to work on the question of who is a problem gambler. In, in a particular uh, premises. Uh, the casino operator at the moment has, has the, uh, that obligation on them, but that's, that obligation has been ex extended and the fine for, uh, for not um, fulfilling that role has also been um, extended as well. So, uh, Mr Speaker, this is a bill that um, was brought in under the previous uh, government. We are very pleased to continue to support it and I'm also pleased to be able to, to say that um, the, this parliament appears <coughs> interested in taking on the issue of problem gambling more widely and I look forward to working with others across the House on that. I call Todd McLean. Mr Speaker, thank you. I rise to speak on the Gaming Amendment Bill No. 2 in the second reading. Uh, and uh, as I was doing research today, Mr Speaker, uh, as I've listened to others uh, here uh, uh, participating in this debate, and certainly since uh, I was elected a Member of Parliament for Rotorua with a great majority of 5,065, only six uh, short months ago, it's clear to me that this is a very important issue. One thing comes up in Rotorua often, uh, and uh, others have given us a name or a nickname about Rotorua. Uh, we, I prefer not to, to use that here today, but gambling can and does damage homes and communities and, of course, individuals. Now, the bill before us today will do a number of things. It amends the Act uh, and will tighten the regulations around monitoring of gaming. Uh, now, all of the intentions of the bill, of course, are to reduce harm uh, on people who have difficulty with gaming. It will mean that organisations of people who receive grants from gaming societies need to be accountable for how uh, that money is spent. 
We said the member, the former member for Otaki, Otaki, asking about the size of majorities. How about we have a little competition before I go on? All the members on the opposite side of the house, put your hand up if you won your seat. Put your hand up if you won your seat. In fact, the only hand I didn't see go up there, Mr. Speaker, was the former member of Parliament, Darren Hughes, from Otaki. Now, a month ago, I was driving through that former electorate, uh, and I had my daughter of four years of age in the back of my car. Uh, and all of a sudden, as we went through the beautiful town of Levin, my daughter started whimpering and crying, and I pulled over and I said to her, what's wrong? As I looked to the left, there was a very large, obscene photograph of the former member of Parliament uh, for Otaki, Darren Hughes. And I've got to say, the grin on your face, Darren, at the time was almost obscene. It looked to me very clearly like it was a photograph that was used in the application for the Milky Bar Kid auditions. Well, the only thing that happened on the 9th of November, uh, the only thing that happened on the 9th of November was the horse was gone. You must have had to ride that big white horse out of that town. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, coming directly back to the, the bill. Coming directly back to the bill. Uh, it is my intention to support this bill, and I believe that the challenge is to balance the private and social costs of gaming machines whilst respecting the right of the majority to gain enjoyment from gambling. Now, we must recognise that social benefits for the community from funding derived from gaming machi machines, whilst recognising that for some, gambling becomes an addiction and that the harm can be done to families through this gambling problem. Now, as I said earlier, the bill will make a number of amendments to, the ga to gaming policy with a view to tightening up on how the gaming industry is operated and to address activities targeted at those who are deemed to exhibit prob problem gambling behaviour. Now, Mr Speaker, gaming machines in New Zealand are legal, but when one, when one reads the newspapers, this is not always obvious. They play a role in our society, uh, and members of this House have previously decided that the enjoyment that can be gained from these leisure activities is acceptable. Now, in my home of uh, Rotorua, around $20 million is spent on gaming machines each year, and from this, significant funds are reinvested in the community. In Rotorua, there are a number of charitable trusts which do very good charitable work, and the funds that they spend uh, do come from gaming. Now, I would say to members uh, of the House, without these funds, there are many, very many community groups and some very important social and community projects that would not get off the ground. But what I do believe, Mr Speaker, is that this House will need in the future to look very closely at where this money is collected from and then where it is spent. Uh, and I'd like to see all the funds that were collected from gaming in Rotorua and especially the small uh, community of Kaurau uh, spent only in these communities. Now, more than $4 million uh, is spent by these trusts in Rotorua each year, uh, and we need to recognise that the important work that some of these funds already do. Uh, and that's a great idea, but I've already got a member's bill in and we can only have one at a time, so we'll get that one out. We'll fix Easter trading for Rotorua, and I'll call on the members opposite to support that, and then we'll come back to that issue very happily. Uh, now in Kaurau, the Lion Foundation committed a substantial amount of money last year to build and upgrade a number of youth facilities, and including our BMX track. Now, without this foundation and the funds that they collected from gaming in Kaurau and elsewhere, this BMX track, which is used by the world-renowned BMX cyclist Sarah Walker of Kaurau, uh, who was in the Olympics last year and, of course, has just uh, uh, received fourth place in the World Championships in Europe, this BMX track that's used by the community and young people of Kaurau would not have been possible. We need to recognise also that in Rotorua, in the many contacts I've had, that the venues that have gaming machines, uh, by and large, are responsible. Uh, they don't gain great financial reward from having the machines uh, there, uh, but they do have them to provide uh, enjoyment for their clients uh, and in so doing uh, to provide uh, uh, funds for the wider community. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, having spoken about some of the positive things that funds from gaming can achieve, I think it's also important to recognise that there does need to be a balance and there can be great harm from gaming. The Rotorua District Council has recently uh, put out uh, a, a report on the impacts of gaming uh, in uh, Rotorua, and I want to quote from that for a moment, if I may. Uh, the Council said in Rotorua, uh, the, the District Council in Rotorua said that Rotorua is a high-risk area for problem, for problem gambling. 
and it has a relatively youthful population profile as well as an, increasingly, uh, an increasing number of elderly on an above average unemployment rate and it serves uh, as the hub for many satellite areas. Now according to the Council's social impact assessment in February of 07, there are between 500 and 1,150 problem gamblers in the district depending upon how problem gambling is defined. Now the report estimates that the gaming machine gamblers in Rotorua lose between 17 and 22 million dollars a year and this loss is not borne evenly across the community with the majority of the loss being borne by the minority of gamblers. Mr Speaker, if we look, uh, look further uh, at gambling and problem gambling in New Zealand, we've heard from others that two, just over two billion dollars a year is waged in New Zealand on gambling and in 2007 uh, two, just over two billion dollars. 950 million of this was lost on poking machines outside of casinos. Now it also, uh, statistics show that three percent of the adult population are considered to be problem gamblers. Uh, uh, 1,537 1, gambling machines, but in total there were almost 20,000 pokey machines in New Zealand outside of casinos. Now, uh, the Member of Parliament speaking earlier, earlier Tururoa Flavel mentioned uh, that, Tururoa Flavel I apparently mentioned that, uh, uh, that Maori and Pacific Island people uh, have uh, greater incidence of problem, problem gambling in our community. But Mr Speaker, when we look at those who seek help for problem gambling from the services that are available in the community, in fact only 28% of Maori people uh, go to seek help. Uh, and this compares with 48% of Europeans in New Zealand and Asians and Pacific Islanders about 7% each. Now if we look at uh, where the problems have been caused, uh, uh, throughout uh, all of those groups, 68% uh, of those who have problems with gambling uh, uh, gamble on non-casino uh, pokey machines. Mr Speaker, I want to talk for a moment about specifically some of the things in the bill that I think will help us greatly in making sure that this industry is regulated properly, uh, but also that we can do much more to help those who have issues and difficulties with gambling. Now, the bill will do a number of things, in particular addressing that of public problem gambling. It will uh, create the requirement uh, to bank gaming machine profits directly into gaming machine society bank accounts. And this means that the revenues that are used uh, will be used for the intended purpose uh, as described in the Act and reduces the chances of misappropriation or misuse of these funds. There will also be a requirement that community grant recipients use grants only for specific authorised purposes for which the grant was made. Uh, and I guess the justification for this uh, uh, requesting a grant, uh, the justification for requesting a grant therefore can't be changed. This too means I believe that there will be less chance for the misuse of funds and that the profits from gaming will benefit the community uh, directly. Uh, there are a number of other uh, important measures in the bill, Mr Speaker, that set out circumstances in which gaming machine societies may apply gam gaming machine proceeds uh, to authorised purposes, and we've heard a lot about that in uh, the debate tonight from other speakers. Uh, there will be a duty for gambling venues to assist potential problem gamblers with ongoing gambling problems and where ongoing gambling problems are suspected. Essentially, uh, Mr Speaker, it will uh, not suffice for a venue to approach a person on one occasion to provide information about problem gambling and then do nothing further should the behaviour continue. And it will also enhance uh, the harm prevention and min minimalisation of regulating <coughs> power. Sorry to interrupt for the example, member, his time has expired. You liked it. You loved it. You want some more. I call Ian Lees Galloway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to uh, be probably the penultimate speaker on, on this bill this, this, this evening. And uh, it's, I've, listened, I've listened to the debate through, uh, through the evening and I've heard the bill. Uh, described variously as, as a technical tidy up, a fix up, an improvement uh, on the original act, uh, and uh, and an improvement uh, to assist with the the intent uh, towards harm minimisation and controlling the growth uh, of of uh, gambling venues and the availability of gambling uh, in our communities. But I think actually this bill, uh, and this has been discussed a lot, I think, but this bill does somewhat more than that. Uh, it's um, it is it, it is trying to address 
issues which are incredibly important to our communities and to our families. And it essentially looks at two areas. And the first is around the transparency, around how gaming funds are both collected and then disseminated in our communities. And then the second part is looking at issues of problem gambling. And, uh, and, and whilst I acknowledge uh, some of the comments made by uh, Mr McClay and also by Mr Garrett um, around uh, the, the good that uh, funds from gambling can actually do for our communities, uh, it is important that we look closely at the transparency of how those funds move around our communities, how they, are, how they come in from gambling and how they go back out and exactly to whom they are going. And, uh, and how trustworthy uh, the processes are around those. So it's good that we're looking at those, but I would like to focus a little bit more on the problem gambling uh, side, of, side of things in this, in this bill. Uh, the Act currently requires the holder of a Class 4 venue licence or a casino operator's licence to develop a policy for identifying problem gamblers. This bill widens the class of people who are required to use the policy to identify actual or potential problem gamblers to include the venue manager or the holder of a casino's licence or a person acting on behalf of either of those persons. The offence provision for the venue manager or the holder of a casino's op casino operator's licence or a person acting on behalf of either of those persons is amended to include those persons as well, and the offence is punishable on summary conviction by a fine not exceeding $5,000. The bill also requires the venue manager, the holder of a casino operator's licence or a person acting on behalf of either of those people, to take all reasonable steps to assist a person if the person's behaviour gives rise to ongoing concerns about problem gambling. And it also provides that an exclusion order must be issued to a self-identified problem gambler if the person has identified himself or herself as a problem gambler and, is, and asked to be banned from a gambling venue. And this is one of the very interesting things about gambling. It is addictive. Problem gambling is an addiction. And people can actually self-identify as a problem gambler and still find themselves overcome by the compulsion to return to a gambling venue. And this places the onus on those venue operators uh, to make sure that they have a plan in place uh, to help and to assist those people who identify themselves as problem gamblers. I'd like to just talk and reflect a while on some of the health issues associated with problem gambling, because as an addictive, uh, not quite a substance like alcohol or, or, or drugs, but, but equally addictive, gambling is a health issue. Uh, and the health implications need to be considered alongside what we're trying to do here tonight with this bill. Uh, and with a large number of New Zealanders each year being characterised as problem gamblers, there are a range of harmful and, and socially damaging effects that have been evidenced to impact individuals, families, whānau and communities. Individuals de defined as problem gamblers can suffer from depression, from poor physical health, physical feelings of withdrawal and compulsion. They display signs of mental addiction similar to drug users. <laughs> and also drastic changes to normal patterns of social interaction and behaviours. A recent Australian study found a, a, number, of, a, a number of key indicators around problem gambling. 20.3% of problem gamblers, gamblers evidence physical as, as symptoms associated with their, problem, with their problem gambling, and this was the like of which uh, Dr Jackie Blue referred to earlier on. 64.5% had significant anger problems that were identified as contributing factors to incidents of violence. 60% of problem gamblers suffered varying forms of clinical depression. And 1.7% of suicides were linked to problem gambling, with 17, between 17 and 24% of all problem gamblers having attempted suicide at least once. 17 to 24 per cent of problem gamblers attempting suicide at least once. 75 per cent of problem gamblers also suffer from alcohol addiction problems. The two are inextricably linked. The Ministry of Health Statistics in 2006 showed that 58 per cent of problem gamblers were cigarette smokers, compared with only 23.5 per cent of the rest of the population. Problem gamblers are identified as three times more likely as non-problem gamblers to be daily persistent smokers. And gamblers who smoked on a daily basis gambled on more days, spending more money than non-daily smoking gamblers. They also craved gambling 
more than other gamblers, uh, than, than the way other gamblers perceived it. And it's highly concerning to me that the select committee was not able to come to a conclusion on the question of uh, poking machines being placed outside of, of uh, gaming venues in order to allow people to smoke and gamble at the same time. Not only that, you're able to smoke, drink and gamble at the same time. Nothing like a, you know, the, the, the ultimate cocktail, the, the ultimate mix, the trifecta exactly of, of, of addictions. What a fantastic way to really send people into a spiral, to, 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 to send people at the margins of our community and push them further out onto the margins. So it's very disappointing that the Select Committee was not able to come to a conclusion on that one. But I'm very pleased to see that the Minister seems to differ from his colleagues uh, who were sitting on, on, the, uh, on the Select Committee and that we might yet see some progress in this area. But it's not just about addiction and health issues uh, that uh, we need to have a focus on problem gambling. 62.9% of problem gamblers in a recent international survey responded that they had perpetrated or been the victim of domestic violence in the last 12 months. 55.6% reported perpetrating physical assault and or sexual coercion, and 25.4% reported severe incidents of domestic violence. In Australia, up to 1,600 divorces per year are directly related to the stress of problem gambling, leading to the creation of possible dysfunctional and damaging impacts upon children. And the children of problem gamblers report, were reported to be two to three times more likely to be abused by both the gambler and their spouse, two, two to three times more likely than the children of non-problem gamblers. Often due to the financial strain placed upon families and households with a problem gambler, money set aside for food and children's needs is redirected into gambling. This can lead to ab absences, truancy, children dropping out from school entirely, and a greater chance that the children may undertake risky behaviour themselves, such as drinking, smoking, drug use and problem gambling. It's a, it's a never-ending cycle unless we are prepared to do something about it. Now this bill this evening is great. We're trying to do something about it. But just like with the sale and supply of liquor, it has to be backed up at the other end by what we're doing in the health sector. We've, it's, it's the, the strategies we have for dealing with drug use, for dealing with alcohol abuse and for dealing with gambling abuse have to not only be at the justice end, not only have to be at the end of the supply and the availability of, of those substances and opportunities, but also at the health end. How do we make sure that there is addiction treatment and appropriate treatment available for people? Well, you'd think, given some of the statistics that I've read out this evening, that the government would have a clear focus on those health issues. But what area do those come under? Where does the funding come from? It comes from mental health. And what has just dropped off the priorities for this government? Mental health. How can we possibly be serious about dealing with drug addiction issues, we're dealing with alcohol addiction issues, and we're dealing with gambling addiction issues if we're not going to have a focus on mental health? How frustrating it must be to be Simon Power at the moment, trying to deal with the alcohol issues. Yep. He's, he's got, he's got, he's, he, there's been bills go through, he's, he's trying to have a discussion in the community, that's fantastic. But without the support of his health minister, how are we actually going to get anywhere? This, it's just appalling that, that it's appalling that the health minister clearly does not think that mental health and, and the maintenance of good mental health in our communities is a priority. When work absenteeism, when family violence, when addiction issues are so prevalent in our communities, now is the last time, now is the last time with a recession upon us and all the mental health issues that come with I'm sorry to interrupt the member, now his is the time has expired. Time to turn our back on mental health. I call Tim McIndoe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a sad irony that just a few moments before rising to take this call, I learnt of the death of one of my most distinguished constituents. Retired Hamilton lawyer Mr Athol Bishop has passed away today. And the reason I mention that in the context of this debate, apart from the fact that he was a man who did great work in our community and who gave great service to his profession, is because I think of Athol at the races at Tirapa. 
He was a very enthusiastic member of the Waikato Racing Club, a man who always behaved with great dignity and decorum, but who loved to flutter. And I mourn his passing, and I send my condolences to his family. I have no doubt that Athol would be strongly in support of this bill that we are debating here tonight. For most members of our society, gambling is an occasional, affordable and pleasurable activity. A day at the races is a great social occasion, as it always was for Athol, but it is for those who set out knowing what they can afford to lose and who have the self-discipline to stick to their limits. An occasional deposit in a pokey machine is a bit of light relief and merely a momentary indulgence. And that's as it should be. That's how it is for most of us most of the time. But it's sobering to reflect on the fact that right around our country, as we consider the second reading of the Gambling Amendment Bill No. 2 in this House tonight, people who can ill afford to waste their money are doing just that because of their addiction to lotteries or pokey machines or scratchy cards or the lure of the TAB or long hours spent in a casino. Problem gambling is a significant and very distressing form of addiction that can be catastrophic for families and personal relationships. It can lead to friction in the home, neglect of children, conflict and dishonesty in workplaces, and a loss of life savings and self-worth. The distressing consequences of this problem are reflected in some sobering statistics associated with other forms of addiction, and members on all sides of the House have drawn attention to some of these tonight, including mental illness, family breakdowns, sometimes even suicide. So it is right that we do all we can in this House to minimise the risk of harm from such an insidious addiction. And it's for that reason, Mr Speaker, that I want to commend the past and present Ministers of Internal Affairs and the Government Administration Committee for the good work that they have done in updating the original Act focusing on a number of issues that have arisen since it took effect nearly five years ago, and furthering the important objective of minimising the considerable harm that some in our communities suffer as a result of their own gambling or that of a close family member. As my colleague, the member for Otago, noted, this bill is a practical measure designed to achieve effective interventions in those areas where problem gambling is most likely to occur. As technology is constantly updated and new gambling opportunities are devised, it's important for legislation to keep pace with evolving trends. To a large extent, this is a bill, as many members have commented, of a technical nature designed to amend the Substantive Act so that it may operate as was originally intended. That's among the reasons why the Select Committee has recommended a new definition of a gaming machine. It was also necessary to ensure that the definition of gaming machine does not unintentionally capture equipment associated with gambling, such as electronic card shufflers, that does not need to be regulated as such. Those who do sterling work in my city of Hamilton to tackle problem gambling and to support those who suffer from it will welcome the amendments in this Gambling Amendment Bill that require licence holders and casino operators to keep a record of every person who is excluded from their venues and to provide this information upon request to appropriate authorities, not to cause shame or humiliation, but to assist problem gamblers to break their serious and calamitous habits. It's appropriate that those who obtain licences to operate gambling establishments and those who are employed in them should be required to exercise responsibility and effective monitoring of those who come to gamble on their premises, especially those who do so on a regular basis. And I'm sure that all of us at times have seen pictures of such misery, for that is what it is. For that reason, it's also appropriate and necessary that the people who work in gaming venues and casinos should be carefully vetted. They must be up to the job. They must be responsible in the way they conduct their activities and their duties, and they must be empowered to take effective steps to intervene where it is obvious that their patrons are doing themselves and their dependents considerable harm. 
This bill, Mr Speaker, sets out those expectations. It allows for regulation of the collection of important information around the, gam the gaming industry, the people, the money and the organisations involved. Mr Speaker, we can never hope to protect all of our citizens from all of the afflictions and temptations that can lead them down the path to serious harm. But as my colleague Dr Jackie Blue recounted, the problems arising from problem gambling can have particularly tragic effects. It's often innocent family members who suffer the most. The link between problem gambling and domestic violence cannot be ignored. This bill is not about sitting in judgment or removing the obligation for people to exercise personal responsibility for their actions, but it is about the minimisation of harm and protection of the highly vulnerable. And as I am the final speaker in this debate, I want to acknowledge the thoughtful contributions to this debate tonight from members of all parties. As Mr Garrett commented, it's refreshing to take part in a debate which is characterised by common sense, consensus and compassion. Those weren't Mr Garrett's exact words, but I'm sure he'll recognise the spirit of them and uh, readily agree to them. The clear expression of collective will that the passage of this bill will send out into our communities will give heart to those who do such important work to tackle problem gambling. And it will strengthen the arm of responsible gaming operators and their employees everywhere. There's no question that many clubs, community groups and charitable organisations depend heavily upon the proceeds of gambling in the form of grants to conduct their activities and to do much good work for a myriad of causes. In my former career, before I came to this House, I was the chief executive of a trust that depended heavily on money from those sources. And so I appreciate that it is often put to very good use and that it is absolutely essential for much that is good in our communities to happen. But I'm sure that almost all of the office holders and grant administrators will welcome the extra safeguards that are built into this amendment bill, as their groups exist to do good works, and I'm confident that they will share the sentiments that have been so widely expressed during this debate. Nobody working in those areas wants to see others come to great harm as a result of gambling. Mr Speaker, this is a serious issue. It's a major problem for a small but significant group of our population right around the country. I commend everybody who has worked on this bill to try to minimise the harm that gambling can do. I thank those who have spent long hours at Select Committee in bringing about improvements to the bill. I have pleasure in supporting it and I commend it to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Gambling Amendment Bill No. 2, second reading. This bill is set down for committee stage next sitting day. I call on Government Order of the Day No. 5. Inquiries Bill, first reading. The Honourable Christopher Finlinson. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Internal Affairs, I move that the Inquiries Bill be now read a first time, and I intend to move that the bill be referred to the Government Administration Committee. Public inquiries uh, have always played an important role in New Zealand society for much of our history. For instance, the first formal inquiry held in New Zealand took place in 1864 to determine the best site for the seat of government, and obviously they reached the right conclusion. Since that time, public inquiries have continued to provide an independent means by which to investigate matters of importance. The Commissions of Inquiry Act 1908 sets out the legal framework within which commissions of inquiry and royal commissions of inquiry currently operate. However, it's become clear that the law relating to public inquiries is not without its problems. In 2006, the Law Commission began to review this law. Uh, in its 2008 report on that review entitled A New Inquiries Act, the Law Commission concluded that the Commissions of Inquiry Act is antiquated and it contains confusing uh, provisions. In addition, the legalistic 
and adversarial practices that have arisen with commission proceedings were seen as potentially adding to the cost and delay uh, of inquiries. The Law Commission also noted the need for a flexible form of statutory inquiry that ministers can use for the less complex, discrete issues that require independent investigation. The Law Commission observed that there has been a move towards the use of so-called ministerial inquiries that take place outside of the statutory framework. And I can see, I can see why the opposition is getting so excited, because most of them were the subject of ministerial inquiries over the last three years. We had Mr Philip Field. Uh, and uh, I don't think I don't think the minister for Co I don't think the minister for common sense uh, was involved. She was too busy suppressing the freedom of New Zealanders with the Electoral Finance Act. And she's, uh, this can be unsatisfactory. Ministerial inquiries can be unsatisfactory, uh, as these inquiries don't have the powers to obtain evidence and must therefore rely on witness cooperation to be effective. There are also no immunities for those taking part in ministerial inquiries. I will say this to the member for Rongatai, that if she, promises, if she promises to stop her incessant inane interjections, I may vote for her for mayor. <laughs> the, Law Commission, the Law Commission recommended that the law relating to public inquiries be reformed and modernised through the introduction of a new Inquiries Act. And this bill responds to that recommendation. The bill provides for the establishment of two new types of inquiries. We're going to have public inquiries, Mr Cosgrove, and we're going to have government inquiries uh, while recognising and providing for royal commissions established under the letters patent. Public inquiries will replace commissions of inquiry and will be appointed for matters of significant public importance. Public inquiries uh, like whether or not the, member for, uh, the former member for Otaki will ever grow up. Uh, public inquiries will be appointed by the Governor-General by order and council. The reports of these public inquiries will be tabled in Parliament. The provisions of the bill relating to public inquiries will also ap apply to royal commissions. Uh, government inquiries... Order, order, order. I'm enjoying it. Oh, yeah, I, I, I know you are. <laughs> I'd actually like to hear what you're saying. <laughs> uh, interjection should be rare and reasonable. There's, there's not much time to go, and I would actually like to hear what the member is saying. The on, the on, Government the inquiries will be appointed and uh, by and report directly to a minister, and they'll deal with smaller and more immediate issues where a quick and authoritative answer is required from an independent inquiry. Uh, the appointment of government inquiries and their terms of reference will be notified in the Gazette. So this bill provides that all types of inquiry established under the new legislation will have the same legal powers and protections available to them. These include the powers to obtain evidence uh, and the immunity from liability for inquirers for anything done in the course of exercising their functions unless the inquirer has acted in bad faith. There's a new provision covering legal assistance for certain persons appearing before public inquiries, like, like Thai workers. Legal aid is not available to those participating in inquiries, yet there are circumstances where the person may need legal representation or advice in order to protect their interests. Inquiries are to be given the ability to recommend to their overseeing department Point. Point of order, the Honourable Darren Hughes. Mr Speaker, I wonder if you could give the House some advice on a very serious matter. This is quite an important member of the Executive. He's the Attorney-General, and he's commenting on uh, matters before a court at the present time, and I think that would be a, a most unwise thing for him to do. Could you advise the House whether or not that was an appropriate matter for him to do in the case of... Uh... I'm, I'm sure the member with his legal background will be able to determine whether it's appropriate or not. The Honourable Christopher Finlinson. Inquiries are to be given the ability to recommend to their overseeing department that funding will be provided for legal representation and it will be the de decision of the overseeing department whether to grant funding from the budget for the inquiry. The current Act refers to concepts of parties and persons entitled to be heard. These participants have an automatic right to appear and be heard and then to be represented before commissions and this can add to the cost and to the adversarial nature of inquiries. 
Under this bill, these concepts will be replaced with the ability for inquirers to decide whether to conduct interviews, call witnesses, hold hearings and so on. However, inquiries will be able to appoint core participants where it's identified that a particular class of persons has a particular interest in the inquiry. Core participants will still have the right to give evidence and make submissions, but the manner by in which they do so is to be determined uh, by inquirers. Under the provisions of the inquiries bill, people appearing before inquiries will have the same privileges as those appearing in civil proceedings as is provided in subpart uh, 8 of part 2 of the Evidence Act 2006. The bill contains new and updated offences to improve the ability of inquirers to control behaviour surrounding inquiries and avoid abuses of their processes. Some of these offences are already contained within the existing Act. However, some new offences such as intentionally preventing a witness from giving evidence or threatening or seeking to influence a witness before an inquiry have been added. These offences will be summary offences with charges to be laid on the police on reference from an inquirer. The penalty for committing any of these offences will be increased from $1,000 to $10,000. The bill also sets out procedures for public access to inquiries and to their documentation. At present, information held by commissions of inquiry and royal commissions is not subject to the Official Information Act 1982. The Inquiries Bill provides that once an inquiry has been completed, documentation from both public inquiries and government inquiries will be subject to the Official Information Act. However, information will be able to be withheld on specified grounds, such as where a submission provided to an inquiry contains sensitive information. Sections 2 and 15 of the Commissions of Inquiry Act, which relate to the appointment of Commissions of Inquiry and Royal Commissions, uh, will be repealed. However, the remainder of the Act will be left in force in the interim as a number of other statutory bodies, such as the Waitangi Tribunal, take their powers from that Act. Uh, note, and I particularly refer to Clause 37, which provides for a mandatory review I'm sorry of, to interrupt the honourable member. of the continuing the time application of the Act. The chair. This debate is interrupted and set down for resumption next sitting day. The House stands adjourned until 2pm tomorrow.